Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hope lunch has been good so far. Uh, I'm here with Kevin Hassett to talk about free markets, uh, as you might expect. Uh, Kevin, of course, was an advisor to President Trump and uh, is also an advisor to National Review Capital Matters, about which more in due course. Uh, first thing that we should say is that it's especially fitting that we're talking today about free markets on what would have been Walter Williams' 87th birthday. So he was born on March 31st and uh, 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 passed away in 2020. I was fortunate enough to take my intermediate micro class from him and you know, he was so many things. He was a syndicated columnist, of course, which is probably how most people know him. Fill-in host for Rush Limbaugh. Economics professor, researcher on labor markets, unemployment, affirmative action, all these topics. But when he was in the classroom, he was a teacher, and it was really remarkable. And one of the things that we always, that you would have said if you were seeing his class, is you said, this guy is gonna teach until the day he dies. And he passed away about 12 hours after he taught his last class in 2020. And so uh, just a remarkable man and uh, uh, you know, a remarkable voice for, for free markets. And so I um, want to kick it off uh, talking to Kevin. Uh, what do you think is sort of the, the state of play in free markets today? And what do you think conservatives can be doing to make sure that we can carry that forward to the next generation? Right, well, I think that uh, we all have to face up to the fact that uh, free markets are under assault in a way that we've never experienced in our lifetime, and that the threat to the country um, and the system that has delivered so much prosperity is the highest that it's ever been. And um, you know, I think that, that if you want to kind of understand free markets and how, it, how they relate to politics, then one of the first things I would ask my graduate students to read is uh, Hayek's Road to Serfdom. And you know, as we watch like, the collapse of the rule of law around us, uh, then you, think, uh, you might think, well, well you know, that's like a political thing. It has nothing to do with economics. But Hayek actually believed that it had everything to do with economics. Um, and, and he basically, now I'm, I'm taking a long book and summarizing it. Uh, he said that there are really two kinds of socialists. Uh, there are socialists who really mean well they, they, they feel bad for the, the little guy, and they, and, and they see the rich guy, and they think, oh, you know, he doesn't really need to have all that, and, and then I can help the starving baby. Um, and the problem with that type of socialist, Hayek said, is that they're, they're going to be incredibly ineffective, uh, and because socialism just doesn't work. And so if you let that sort of warm-hearted socialist run a country, then the country's going to be in such bad shape so soon that that person's going to lose their job. Um, but he said, by far, this is why he, the title of the book is The Road to Serfdom, after all, right? Not The Road to Poverty, um, The Road to Serfdom. And so why did he say that it's a, road, it's a road to serfdom, socialism? Well, it's because of the second type of socialist, and it's the type of socialist that we see right now. And the second type of socialist is a person who really doesn't care about anything other than their own power and wealth. The kind of person that would, you know, bring a lot of business to the U.S., but it has to go through Hunter Biden. Um, that, okay, so, so that, that person can appeal to sort of the warm-hearted leftist voter and, with socialist uh, discussion. Uh, and they're not going to be any more effective uh, than the warm-hearted socialists, according to Hayek. And so their economy is going to stink, too. Um, but they're brutal. And inevitably, they abuse the rule of law in order to hold power. Because the voters would vote them out, but the, but the effective socialist, the mean-hearted socialist, is able to neutralize voters, uh, either with voter fraud or, you know, in, in many countries, uh, they just stop having elections after they become socialists, or at least what you'd really call an election. And so I think that we're at a point right now where, you know, the, the mean-hearted socialists, the ones that don't care about our institutions, the ones that we talked about last night with the judge, and I'm sure we'll talk about with Barr later on, are in control. Um, and, and we you know, have to think about how are we going to stop them. And, and we'll talk about that, because I know we want to talk more about that's why we built Capital Matters, mm -hmm. is that we recognize that, that our country is under an existential threat. But let's just look at um, what's going on right now, like what, what they're doing uh, to our country on the economic side. Uh, so do you remember uh, when President Trump took office? 
that the story from all the elite uh, ec economists of the Democratic Party and the Obama administration was that, sure, growth was really terrible. And sure, between 2000 and 2016, uh, wage growth was zero. You may recall, in real terms, it was zero. So, 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 so the median household was no better off in 2016 than they were in 2008. And I actually group Bush and Obama policies together. I'll argue with my Bush friends, but President Bush was not a supply sider. Uh, and, and, and so, but, but what happened was that the Obama people told us it's the new normal. Uh, and they said, it, it's just, it's not our fault. It's not our policies. But then we came in and we just pushed a free enterprise agenda with lower taxes and lower regulation and so on, me and Larry Kudlow and President Trump and Steven Mnuchin and Gary Cohn. Uh, and, and over the three years before COVID, uh, that thing that had been flat between 2000 and 2016 uh, increased by $6,000 per family. $6,000 per family. And then, you know, rather than continue, like, so imagine you're, you're a person who actually cares about voters and not, you're not like a venal, power-hungry politician. And then you looked and you saw that the wages didn't grow and then they did grow. That, would, would the first thing that you do be reverse everything? You know, if you're at all intellectually curious, no. So if you really want to wonder why I'm saying that it's the evil socialists that are in charge now, not the nice socialists, is that they didn't even care about the fact that the little guy was so much better off. And, and so we could go into a lot of the things that President Biden and his team have done, but here's the, the, the factoid that um, makes me the most angry. Um, right, so, so they're apparently, they care so much about the little guy and bringing jobs back to America and so on like that. So, so uh, real, real hourly wages have declined in the US now for 22 months in a row. That's the longest streak on record in US history. We've never had 22 months of decline in a row until we get Joe Biden. And it's just astonishing to me that these people who could do things like abuse the rule of law and all the things that, that we've seen can destroy the economy like this and the only place that you can read about it is Capital Matters. Like, like so, so when, it, when have you seen, uh, President Biden was out this week bragging about the manufacturing boom uh, that has happened on his watch. Uh, manufacturing's down on his watch. Uh, so anyway, so, so I think that where free enterprise is, is that people who are really uh, apparently indifferent to the welfare of the ordinary citizen and um, very effective at destroying the economy are in control right now. Uh, and they're a, a real threat to the future of our country if that control continues. So Kevin, you wrote a piece for Capital Matters a while ago, 10 Steps of Stagflation. Um, I promise we'll get to positive stuff in a moment. Where do you think we are on the 10 steps to stagflation and, and, and how, how do you see that playing out over the next you know, five to 10 years maybe? You know, I, like, like I I've, have had uh, friends with substance abuse problems and you know, a lot of regard for 12 step programs and so on. And, and, and I got to admit though, that the, the one good thing I can say about the Biden administration is that they finally made it to step one, admitting you have a problem. Um, <laughs> They have, uh, and, uh, but the fact is that uh, what happens with inflation, and I'm not gonna go through all 10 steps, it'll <laughs> take too long, but what happens is you get an inflation shock, uh, and it can happen if, say, you mail checks to people and you finance that by printing money. Sound familiar? And then all of a sudden it's a helicopter drop of money, you get an inflation shock, wages don't adjust, uh, because wages move slowly, and so everybody's real wage goes down. Um, we just had we just talked about 22 months in a row of declining real wages. When, you, when your real wage goes down, then you have less money to buy stuff. Uh, and so you end up at a recession, which we had last year. It's just, if, if President Trump were in the White House, the two negative quarters last year would have been the worst recession in the history of America in the New York Times and the Washington Post, and especially on NPR. Uh, and, uh, and so then what happens is uh, the Fed starts, sees the inflation and starts acting. And they're able to get inflation down um, this is sort of in the middle of the process, uh, until price and wage inflation are equal to each other. And this is a historical pattern that we've seen across many countries, and in this country too, back in the 70s especially. But once price inflation and wage inflation get to be the same, then the Fed has a problem, because uh, firms won't uh, cut the uh, price below what it takes to cover their wages, because if they do, they'll go out of business. 
Uh, and so price, sticks, price inflation sticks at wage inflation, and the Fed is like raising interest rates, trying to get uh, unemployment to go up so that wage inflation goes down and price inflation can go with it. And um, we're at that point. We're still at that point. The Fed's been moving way too slowly, way too uh, mildly. Uh, and the, the history of it is that the interest rate has to be well above the inflation rate, the nominal interest rate, for inflation to go down. Uh, we're still not there even with the numbers that came out today. Uh, and, and so until the Fed whacks the economy so much that the unemployment rate goes way up, uh, then wage inflation and price inflation are gonna stay around five. And they've been that way, uh, we're in that holding pattern right now. And, and with the bank issues going on, uh, potentially giving the Fed an excuse to stop, mm -hmm. and you know, then there's, there's a real risk that inflation is gonna stay this high for, for a really long time and even go up from here. Because recall that in the 70s, what happened was that the, they would, the Fed would try to act to get inflation under control, and then there would be like a little bit of negative effect on the economy, a small recession or something. And, the, and then the Fed would say, okay, well, inflation's 7%, but I don't want to hurt people anymore, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop tightening. Uh, and if you do that for a few years in a row, then you end up with double-digit inflation. And so, so my final thought about inflation, uh, and we, we will find lots of upbeat things to talk about yeah. after this, I, is that, you know, not, not to, to, to bring forth bad memories, but the way you need to think about uh, what's going on with the economy and inflation is that it's gonna be just like COVID in the sense that there's gonna be waves that you're gonna think like, so right now we had a mild winter, so energy prices are a little bit low and, and used car prices are, are, are helping. And, and so inflation is gonna be down a little bit, uh, but it's gonna go right back up. Yeah, I, mean, the, I mean, this bank bailout is $2 trillion of new money into the economy. How are you gonna do that and not make inflation go up? Uh, and, and so the, the waves will get worse and worse if the Fed acts like the Fed acted in the 70s. Now I'm, Pleased that they just lifted rates even with a bank crisis going on, but I'm really anxious that they're, they're not gonna give us the sort of four more rate increases that we need to get inflation under control. And if they don't, then it's gonna be like the waves of COVID. So obviously there's a lot of positive history in our country's economic history as well. And um, uh, one of the things that uh, Alan Gelzo was talking about yesterday on his panel was about how, uh, how much uh, economic growth has improved people's lives over the last, say, 100 to 150 mm -hmm. years in a way that's unprecedented in human history. For, for thousands of years, people lived at basically the same uh, level of subsistence, and there was a handful of wealthy people that we read about in history books and things like that, but the vast majority of people were, were poor, uh, and there was really nothing they could do about it because we didn't have modern economic growth. Now we've had that and for the, you know, for the first time in human history, we've had huge waves of people all around the world being able to come out of extreme poverty, being able to provide for their families and make a better life, uh, make a better life for their children. Um, obviously in the United States, the last 20 years or so, we've been stuck around low 1%, 2% inflation, or 1% or 2% economic growth after being able to have four or five percent in, in, in previous decades. Uh, that solves a lot of problems. Obviously it solves the recession problem by definition, but it also solves problems like the national debt because if you have a faster growing economy, you can bring that debt burden down. It solves problems with defense spending because uh, a wealthier country that's growing faster can afford to spend more on, on national security. Uh, it helps with poverty alleviation. It helps welfare. Uh, bringing down welfare costs because people are able to support themselves. And so how do we get back to that history that we know we have in us, but uh, all too often it seems like government's standing in the way? Well, you know, first of all, uh, I'll remind of the history when I started in the White House right after President Trump took office. And um, we put out, as the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, that you're the head of something that sounds like really cool and, and science fiction-y. It's called the Troika, right? The Troika. It sounds like the Troika is like this Romulan thing that is going to harm us. But, <laughs> but the head of the Troika is in charge of the government forecasts. And um, you know, we went back and we actually said uh, to the president and to the cabinet members, that um, you know, we know that the president has made a promise of 3% growth. 
Uh, we know that everybody thinks it's the new normal and that when we come out with that, that there are gonna be people who say, oh, you're just putting out a political uh, a document. Uh, and, and what we did is we challenged everybody uh, to give us policies that could take you from 1% growth to 3% growth. And so we you know, designed the, the tax cuts exactly the way we did uh, to go after the business sector, which is the highest tax place on earth uh, to, be, to run a business was the US when we got there. Uh, and then we used really hard science to estimate what would happen uh, to growth if we had those tax cuts, and if we did the deregulation, and if we did you know, really aggressively push uh, energy exploration and help pipelines form and stuff like that. And, and so if you go back and look at the first economic report of the president, um, where we actually laid out where 3% growth comes from, then we actually built it up piece by piece with sound policies. And, um, and then we got 3% growth. Uh, if you uh, ever Zoom with me when I'm in my office, there's uh, one of my favorite possessions, which I didn't make for myself, but a friend gave to me. What, after, uh, near the end of the Trump administration, the Wall Street Journal editorial board went back and looked at what I said about what would happen to growth if we passed the policies. This was just pre-COVID. And then they wrote a long unsigned editorial uh, with my picture on it, and they said, wow, he was actually right about every single thing. Uh, and and in, in a marriage where I'm not right about anything, um, it was really refreshing. Um, it's funny how like we get the Wall Street Journal delivered, but I couldn't find the journal that day. Um, <laughs> still, uh, but 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 I but I we were right within a tenth or two, and and and, and that's actually like the, the other thing I want to say, is that, that why were we right? It's not that we're geniuses. It's just that um, that we thought about it a little bit, and that what's going on now uh, is so detestable to me because it's so obvious, and I'll just give you an example. Um, I was talking about this on Larry Kudlow's show yesterday. That, so, so suppose that you increase government spending um, relative to GDP by about 5% relative to what we thought. It's about what they did. And suppose that you don't do anything to make supply go up. In fact, you attack supply. But let's say supply doesn't go down. Supply just stays the same. So you've got 5% more GDP of nominal demand, uh, but you don't have any more supply and so what has to happen by construction is that inflation has to be 5%. It's the only way it can happen, because you're gonna spend the money, the government's gonna spend the money, but they're not gonna have more stuff to buy because they've been actually attacking supply, so inflation goes to 5%. And I can remember, I don't know if, if Rich is in the room right now, but Rich interviewed me right after we at Capital Matters were really the first ones anywhere on the internet to say inflation is coming. And I said, I'm 100% sure inflation this year is going to be 7%. And Spelter Fertile say, and I said that in what was April, I think. Uh, and, and, it, and why was I 100% sure? Because you guys now know if you lift GDP 5% nominally, but you don't do anything to make supply go up, then you're going to have 5% inflation. It's so obvious. Uh, and yet we have an entire administration, an entire party that's in science denial about this. Um, and so, yeah. I, you know, I think that the good news is that this is easy to fix. Maybe we can start to move towards the happy ending of our, of our talk because we've done it before. We just did it. And, and, and it's a roadmap that's pretty easy to follow. Uh, and, and the Biden administration has messed stuff up so much that it'd be really easy to give you like 4% growth really, really fast uh, just, just by reversing the really stupid stuff that they've done, uh, like the global minimum tax, so that, you know, the removing the tax benefit for research and development, uh, spending a trillion dollars on green energy, to subsidize green energy. If, if you're subsidizing green energy with, with a, a trillion dollars, well, you're doing uh, that because green energy is less efficient. So you're, by construction, making the economy less efficient. Um, I know how to make the economy more efficient. Uh, and if you do that, then things can boom. And that's really what we're talking about at Capital Matters uh, just about every day, uh, that we, you know, when the Biden administration comes out and says stuff that's patently wrong, then, you know, we call it out. But we're also building an agenda for, you know, the next person who actually cares about the economy, be they a Democrat or a Republican, to make, make the economy better. And I think that the good news, again, is that, that the agenda is not that complicated. It's not, rock, it's not rocket science. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's, and, you know, earlier you mentioned, you know, uh, you know, why were we right about this? Well, it's not because we're geniuses, right? And, 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 and I think that that's, that's exactly the right attitude and it's an attitude more politicians need to have because, um, you know, we're not geniuses, but 
there's lots of people out there who are, and they have great ideas, and they want to invent stuff, and they want to start companies, and they want to do all this stuff, and right. and and that's who the American people are. That's that you know that start with sources of our strength. I mean, that's 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 a big one, and and um, and what they need to be able to do is just be allowed and be permitted to be able to uh, to to do that. And um, uh, and and like you said, you know, that's kind of what we're arguing at Capital Matters because. I think there's an attitude sometimes among conservatives uh, to be sort of apologetic about support for free markets and, and to sort of, uh, you know, there's been sort of an attitude uh, recently that you may have detected that's like, well, free markets are good when times are nice, but when times are tough, whether because of an outside threat or because of, uh, you know, uh, domestic economic problems, that's when we need the government to kind of step in and make things right. And that's the complete backwards view of, um, of, of how this is supposed to work, right? The, Free markets aren't just a thing that's nice to have. They are a necessary ingredient to mm -hmm. uh, our flourishing and to our economic growth. And then, like I said before, all the things that come up, come off of that, uh, you know, the, the ability to spend more on defense, the ability to, to solve uh, solve the debt problem, the ability to get people off of welfare. And, 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 and you know, that is, uh, that is really um, something that has been missing from the conversation. What we've been trying to do at Capital Matters is bring it back. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and, and again, um, the, the fact is that uh, one of the things that the left does, right, is, is they, first they control a lot of the media, but not us, and we will never be canceled, never. Um, and uh, then they uh, attribute authority to the people that spout the socialist claptrap that they like uh, and um, attribute respectability. Uh, uh, hand out Nobel Prizes to Paul Krugman. Um, and, and then when Paul Krugman says something that you know, makes no sense at all, like you, like you go back to the 5% example about, of course you gotta have 5% inflation, right? But he'll say no. And then you, know, you uh, will be you know, lowly Kevin or Dominic and will say, well, actually you're gonna have 5% inflation. And then what'll happen will be that you know, on, on CNN or in the Post or the Times, they'll say, well, you know, Nobel Prize winner <laughs> Paul Krugman yeah. says we won't have inflation, and, um, you know, the partisan right-wing Kevin Hesse says we will. <laughs> well, um, fortunately, we do have Nobel Prize winners Friedman and Hayek out there. So they, that, we that, do, that, that, we those do. Those are good ones to have. It, but it's, yeah. it's hard to find. Uh, I, I'm not sure there'll ever be another conservative Nobel Prize winner because it's just a political yeah. tool. But, but my point is just that, that we're actually right. And, and, and we document it every day, and that's why traffic is skyrocketing to capital matters. And I think that in the end, the people who are right, this is why America's great, the people who are right are the ones who truly control respectability uh, and uh, can dish it out. And I think that that's what we've built at Capital Matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we get so many great uh, contributions from outside people that don't normally write for National Review and have good expertise on, on specific areas. And, uh, and I think that's one of the ways that we can, can really add value. You know, we just had a piece uh, yesterday that ran from an Israeli uh, economist talking about Israel's uh, industrial policy and why it didn't work for, for that country and, um, and how the success that they've been able to have has been, you know, getting government out of uh, the financial sector, especially, was the argument that he made in that piece. And it was really, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really great to be able to have all those different perspectives who, uh, you know, don't work for National Review, who wouldn't write for us every day, but have a, a really good uh, a really good take on uh, one specific issue and can just write that for us and, and Capital Matters right. is the platform and the place where that can happen. Yeah, we've we've built an arena. It's it's one of the uh, things that I've done in my career, uh, you know, collectively with the team at National Review that I'm most proud of, because what the left wants to do is they want to make it so that you're a fundamentally discredited person. You're a conspiracy theorist if you support and defend free enterprise. Uh, and uh, what we've done, and, and, and everybody in this room knows that's going on and is really, excuse me, pissed off about it, you wanna do something about it. And we believe that if we made a place where there are a bunch of us just, of, of us just started writing, uh, that there'd be people from all over the world that would be sending you know, unsolicited manuscripts to us saying, oh, I wanna be part of that conversation too. And that's the, that's the thing that's happened. I gotta say that, that we, we talk about big things, but what it, I also like the little important things uh, that we do, and, and one of my favorite ones is the work that Dominic's done on the banning of gas stoves. <laughs> and, and, and like just really quickly, uh, 
the, the, if you ban gas stoves, then um, gas consumption in the US goes up. Because uh, if you, it's really efficient to bring the gas to a house and then you, you light it up and the, and the energy's right there. But if you don't let the guy have a gas stove, then you gotta generate the electricity you know, 100 miles from his house, and then you gotta send it in wires where they lose a lot of electricity along the way. And, and so this is the, the reason I love this is that we're fighting an opponent that doesn't care about what the truth is. They just care about like, the posture that they're you know, able to make when they say that they're for this or for that. And it's really been fun to uh, watch us expose things like that, they, like the big things and the little things. But it's the little things, I think, for me, have often been more entertaining. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, and it's a great just illustration, too, of the mindset of, well, we can't trust people to make decisions for themselves. We have to make decisions for them. We know what's best, and we're going to impose it. And, um, and I, I just think that it's, it's, it's so uh, contrary to our, our spirit as a country, to the things that we've done. And, you know, uh, up until this, uh, you know, uh, in our history, we're, we're unusual among Western democracies in that we do not have an explicitly named socialist party that's a major player in elections, right? You know, obviously, certain parties have taken bits and pieces of it along the way. Biden administration's especially bad on that right now. But, uh, you know, we have, we have never had that because there's just something in our national character that, that, that's repulsed by that, that doesn't like being told uh, by by planners and by and by government bureaucrats that uh, you know this is the way you have to do things because we've we've seen in our history that uh, you know government tries to do things it doesn't work and we've seen all the different ways that uh, that the private sector has been able to uh, innovate and, and make our lives better uh, in in ways that that government can never do right and and, and uh, in my book the drift which you guys have probably seen mentioned on TV a lot because Larry Kudlow is a friend of mine and he says too many nice things about the book. But, but, but it's all about what's happening uh, to free enterprise in our country. Uh, but the subtitle is Stopping America's Slide to Socialism. Uh, it's a guide to stop it. And we can. We can do it. And um, you know, we've, we've almost run out of time. But, it, but there's a, like a deep uh, firmly rooted in, in the great writings of the past of Schumpeter and, and Hayek and Friedman, there, there's a, a deep reason for optimism uh, and a, a belief that if people like us stand up to defend, defend free enterprise, then it will win. And, and so Capital Matters, uh, I'm just thrilled that, that Natural Review came to me and we formed this place where free enterprise could be defended. Uh, because it's really like almost you know step one of the how do we stop socialism in my book is that you have to recapture respectability, take it away from the idiots socialists who claim that they're respectable and are always wrong, and then you have to create a place where people who defend free enterprise are celebrated uh, and not intimidated. Yeah, definitely. And you know, in National Review, I mean, we're not moving on this. We, we this is where we stand. You know, we. You know, uh, standing with our history is, is kind of our thing, and uh, this one is definitely an issue where we know that uh, that this is the right thing to do, and we're not budging on it, no matter what um, you know politicians might say about it. And I think uh, you know, and a Andrew Stutterford uh, is the, the editor of the the section, and um, uh, you know, he'll talk about get these big we, we get these big pieces sometimes that are three thousand words. We just ran one from. Uh, uh, a guy named Terrence Keeley, who used to work for uh, BlackRock and, um, uh, and, and used to, uh, you know, knows a lot about ESG as a result of that, but he's becoming skeptical of it and, and wrote a big piece for us, 3,000 words, sort of walking through, you know, I know this better than anyone and this is why it's not working, this is why it's not, uh, this is why it's not effective. And, you know, that is the kind of piece, who else is going to run that? 3,000 right. word piece about that? I mean, you can't fit that, you know, Wall Street Journal might agree with it, but they can't fit that in there. You know, they they have, uh, you know, what what mainstream publication, you know, New York Times never never gonna touch that, right? So, uh, so you know, that's sort of the advantage that we have in terms of a spot to be able to run things of all different lengths and all different arguments coming from different perspectives, but all united around that idea about the importance of free markets and the importance of standing firm on that. So, uh, thank you so much, all for your, for your time. Thank you.